and action. Oh, John is the guy that can diagnose broken fiber optic cables from his bedroom at two in the morning. We gotta hold onto this guy. <laughs> Hi guys and welcome back to the 30 day challenge. Today I'm not talking about myself, I have actually an interview guest, my friend John. Hello. So can you just briefly tell us something about yourself? Well, there's many dimensions and I will let you, the interviewer, uh, lead me astray into which little calculated corners <laughs> of my mind you want to go. Alright. So guys, today is the first time that I actually have an interview guest on my channel. Beforehand, I only did solo recordings of myself, teaching you about some things in life. Today I would like to talk about things I don't know so much about myself. So let's get to it. So John is a software developer for many, many years. Maybe you can just tell a little bit about uh, us, how do we know each other? We are in this um, Hash House Harriers organization. It's, it's basically yet another social group, but with a sordid history <laughs> and a, a remarkable staying power, uh, especially considered it, it's very decentralized. And that, that's wow. going to be a key theme in our discussions uh, today. A very decentralized organization. There's commonality, for sure, uh, across the small chapters around the world. A lot of uh, mixing, daily travel. We go to other people's kennels, as they're called. And when we do that, there's a lot of commonality, a lot of similar sort of themes, although the people are obviously different in different countries, different uh, adaptations, different conventions. There's no central organization. Nobody says this is a hash or this isn't. And maybe at some, at some point, you know, that sort of thing will come into play. But at the moment, it's remarkably persistent and stable uh, over 50 years. of. Uh... Thank you very much. Yeah, the hash is basically a running club which I discovered around four, four and a half years ago when I was living in St. Louis, Missouri. And this club is really global. It has been founded in the 1930s by some British soldiers in Kuala Lumpur and has been around ever since. So every big city in the world you will find a club. And I'm, I'm very glad that we can talk today because uh, John is a very interesting person and has so much to talk about. So John, where did you actually grow up? So John, where did you actually grow up? You assume I did. But anyway, <laughs> let's make that assumption. I uh, had a, a distributed um, um, growing up uh, environment. I was, uh, oh geez, we, we, my family moved you know, like, like 10 times, 20 times, I don't know. Well, I, my parents moved around a lot before I was born, but generally America, Canada. Uh, I had a couple of years when I was a child in India that left some, let, uh, left some formative memories. You were in India too? Yes, I was. In which place? Uh, a little town, a little bit north of Tarapur. Sorry, right. sorry, Bombay, in a little town called Tarapur, yeah. which is very near where they built the uh, first uh, nuclear reactor, power plant reactor, which is why I why I was there, to my father's job. And uh, later on, after finishing university, I came to Switzerland, where I have lived for 30 years in, in the Zurich area. Mm -hmm. So you might say I'm, I'm settled here in Switzerland, but in fact, I, I, it's more accurate to say I'm based here in Switzerland because it's very easy to travel around the world from here and still come home to a nice, fine, central place. Interesting. So what made you come to Switzerland? Well, uh, as a matter of fact, I'm Swiss. Oh, you are Swiss? I am, mm -hmm. yeah. And what are your areas that you're actually working in? You mean right now? Right now, yeah. Well, I uh, do some programming, mm -hmm. but it's not my main uh, uh, thing that occupies my time. I am doing uh, um, IT computer security mm -hmm. at the moment, which also involves auditing, but it involves a lot of technical awareness. It's like technical consulting, but um, the awareness of the consulting. I also do uh, Unix engineering and software development in various areas, and I often end up uh, trying to glue systems together with uh, various software constructs. And I do some um, programming on the side for other special purposes. Interesting. And how did you enter into the developing activities in the first place? When I was at university, there were uh, a, there was a division that they had um, trying to get their their head around as to where this uh, computer thing fit into the established uh, university disciplines. Mm -hmm. And there is a distinction between science, engineering, and mathematics. 
and each uh, of those themes branched out in different ways and I've done all of them. And on the science side, the, the computer science, as was known in the universities, they would give you an education in programming software development that was called the science of it or the skill of it. And I did it and I, uh, and I really had a knack for it, it turned out. And I did very well. And so I you know, turned that into a, well, a career. And in fact, I have had jobs where I was mostly doing the programming. But there's always side things in the computers. You got to fix this. You got to fix that. Of course, you're networking, and that doesn't connect. And you got to do a lot of things. So I actually developed a lot of skills of troubleshooting operations of computers mm -hmm. and networks, and the whole you know installation, the operating system, and how they fit in the bigger picture, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. What were some interesting uh, highlights of your developing career? I was once working uh, for a big bank, and we were doing this. Um, operation development a special a failover mm -hmm. project concept where one computer could fail and the other one pick it up to be highly reliable and it turned out that it, the highly reliable part wasn't strictly necessary it caused more problems than it solved because it was quite complicated to maintain the notion of which computer is really online and, and the whole connection can break as well uh, for example is once in the server room and I saw these guys they just sort of slapped it together and like you yeah, know this is really sloppy and this is back in the early days when fiber optic cables were still kind of new and they were just sort of mm -hmm. there. And they're fragile. If you don't put them in right, you they're can fragile. Break them. Yeah, they will break. And they were just strewn on the floor for these guys doing it. I was like, hmm, this is pretty sloppy. And so I was also on picket duty as a freelancer. I was making good money for this, too. And I got this uh, phone call. Uh, the phone rang at like 2 in the morning, you know. Oh, wow. Like, oh, my goodness. Got to <laughs> get up. Got to get up. And his voice actually said, John Wyatt. Anyway, I got to go. So I went under my little office nearby and I logged in. Like, hmm, hmm, what's happening here? Like, one computer keeps failing over and it's stable. It's not stable. It goes back to the other one. Like, what's going on here? What is this all about? You know? And it's a big deal. This is our super extensive uh, financial exchange brokering system. And so the managers are piling on the call. Like, yes, what's there? Whatever. And who's techo? Who's the techo guy on the call? Oh, John's here. Like, oh, no, sorry. Oh, yes, John's here. John's here. John, what's going on? Like, I'm in my room, I'm my, my room at home. Like, mm -hmm, what's going on? Yes, well, you know, we have operation. Blah, blah, blah. They can say, what the heck is this all about, you know? He says, well, you know, the Simpsons are says, here's one pie that's stable, and the other one is, it's, then it fails over, it's not there. Well, how oh, software, blah, 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 the vendor, blah, 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 who's going to go on site, blah, blah, what are you going to do? So I'm thinking to myself, you know, I bet you I know what the problem is. You know, it's, a, it's an intermittent failure that you'd see if you have wires that are, that are loose connection. And those guys were sloppy. On their cabling on the floor, and I noticed it's going out of the, the hallway there. Uh, there's a bunch of construction activities going on, and workmen are coming and going. It's like, I bet you those stupid workmen are stepping on the stupid uh, fiber optic cables <laughs> and breaking the darn things. They're just intermittently failing, and if they did, that's exactly the pattern you'd see of the cross connect. So I said, hmm, with my advanced life software diagnosis, I think there's a, a two thirds, seven, uh, three quarters chance, you know, 75% chance that you are having. Um, intermittent breaks of your fiber optic cables and they are degrading and we're causing um, intermittent failovers. Uh, the networks themselves around them are stable. I highly recommend we lock down one node and disable the failovers until the morning we can go investigate. I like, well, what do you mean the fiber optics break? How, how, do, how do they break? <laughs> oh, they're breaking all right. Oh, yeah. Oh, really? And the vendor's like, well, I don't know. It's all dodgy, tricky. Making it's 2 a.m. gone. The trading's coming. Of course, we're at Global Bank. So in New York, they're coming online, seeing what's going offline. Really, I recommend we'll just lock it down to one node and be done with it and you know, continue operation. And what if that node fails? You know, we have statistical models of probabilistic failures and the tolerance is there and we're in, you know, we're in the profile. Like, mm -hmm. All right, John, right. So sure enough, we lock it down, everything's fine, go back to bed. And um, the next day they go in, and sure enough, the, the darn fireworks are broken. Just when I said the workmen are stepping on the darn things, and they break it. I'm like, yeah, see, told you. And all of a sudden, all these global managers are like, Whoa, John is the guy that can diagnose broken fiber optic cables from his bedroom at two in the morning. We got to hold on to this guy. <laughs> I uh, raked that one out pretty well. <laughs> Just simple observation of dumbass behavior. Yeah, they paid. Oh, boy, did they pay. Good for you, good for you. Yeah, it looks like developers are, are in need more than ever, right? It's not just development. It's, it's the whole thing around it, you know, getting things done, making it work. And, of course, IT security, which is kind of what I'm specializing in now. Oh, let's talk about IT security or lack thereof. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I mean, in fact, I, I use IT security um, a lot in everyday life. Mm -hmm. And one of the, uh, the uh, things you learn about IT security is how to prevent attacks that have a large component of social engineering. You know, where you, you talk somebody into doing something, yeah. it's highly useful. I tell you, like I was flying back <laughs> from, you know, uh, uh, America to Switzerland the other day. 
And sure enough, you go to the check-in part and says, oh, where is your, you know, the Swiss government requires your contract tracing form. Where is it? Of course, there is no such thing, and I don't have it. It's like, oh, it's right here in this German language paper, the QR code. You could read QR codes, can't you? Uh, well, I'm not so sure. Well, it's right there then. Uh, okay, okay, in you go. Okay. Easy peasy. Yeah, social engineering. I, I heard that term a lot uh, during my time at uh, big corporations. Because actually corporations, get, they get hacked by social engineering, right? By somebody picking up the phone. It's not just corporations. Like, uh, pre pretending to be someone else. It's, it's like in Star Wars, you know. These yeah. are not the droids you're looking for. Huh? <laughs> droids, <laughs> True, oh, yeah. yeah. You can move on. Go on, go on. Okay. The Jedi skills. But <laughs> <laughs> so you're also coding. You you know so much about um, about coding. You you code in Perl, Python, Java, Bash, and so on. What's your favorite language? Uh, you know, my favorite language is the one that's not yet developed, but I would like to uh, bring it about for okay. robot controls. Right. And um, I'm absolutely unimpressed by the so-called field of artificial intelligence. It's more, um, you know, a lack of art, uh, artificial stupidity, if you ask me. And I think there's a, a phrase that's kind of come out about this system is as dumb as a robot. Uh, <laughs> uh, and the language that I intend to come up with is going to make robots uh, more functional. And, and the uh, it's going to be like an object-oriented one that's basically... Um, primarily based on two things. It's called a this, that protocol. This, take this, do that, mm -hmm. there, and don't give me any grief. But you have to follow workflow. Workflow sucks. It's a configuration, this, this, there, do it. Or else, or else what? Or else I'm gonna sue your ass off. <laughs> do you think that uh, robots or uh, AI will take over the world one day, like in the Matrix? Um, um, you know, I, I like to I envision this uh, dark fantasy of the apocalypse, when the robots have taken over and about to come and confiscate your house, you know, and then one of them trips in the stairs and said, you know, ah, 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 you got to get out now, but you're blocking the door. Get out now, but you're blocking the door. Doesn't compute. Call your administrator. Call your administrator. But you are the administrator. Call your administrator. Call your administrator. I'm the administrator. Okay, boss, what should I do? Get the hell out of here. Yeah, yeah. Bring them on. Bring them on. I can't wait. I can't wait for these little guys. Come on. Come here. Come here, master. Come here. Come here. Come here. Come here. Come here. Come talk to Johnny. I got a few questions for you. Uh, that would be very interesting, huh? Oh yeah. This uh, it, it's kind of funny because when you talk about AI, there's many scientists actually believe that we will never have something like um, a superior AI, a smart AI that actually can be smarter than humans. Do you, do you agree? Well, I think that's a whole um, a whole misnomer. People mm -hmm. are. Uh, leaving sort of the, the, the practical realm, uh, especially the, the realm of the discipline, and talking about their uh, human nature projections. I mean, you, you talk about something that's smart in the sense of being useful, you automatically come up with something threatening. <gasps> You're threatening, are you smarter than me? La -dee -da -dee -da. Basically, you can, you can define levels of smartness, shall we say, in a simplistic way. And one of the, the first parts is, is something have conditional you know, uh, logic. Uh, for example, a simple example is a thermostat. You, you, you turn up the dial to turn up the heater and it cranks out heat. It's too hot. You turn it down and then the, you put a little sensor in the thermostat that says, oh, if it's already a temperature at, I'm at, don't turn on the heater. And once it goes down too much, you turn it back on. That, that's just a little variance. It's already a, a smartness. I mean, that's basic from years ago. And you have this in, in, in cars, like like uh, cruise control. And I remember back in the 70s, you know, dicking around with a car, you like a vacuum, you bleed the vacuum from the, you know, from the, the intake manifold, and it just pulls the, the, the throttle back a bit. It has a balance there. It's a really simple little device. It's smart. Of course, it's really unreliable and low tolerance. And then they, they have electronic ignition, and this thing just governs the thing. And then they go more and more. They can say, you know, you can say, well, okay, you're cruising along, but if you hit the brakes, you cut it out. Okay, there's a smartness right there. It's all these little things that are dependent about you. Know, that, that, that's what smartness is. But what you're talking about, I mean, is that ever going to take over humanity? I mean, it, it, it might save your life on the road because of dis anti lock brakes will disengage and things like that. But, you know, these things are just... just um, mechanical conveniences making things smooth operations there's nothing really you know threatening to your to your human domain about it what you're talking about is when you know when, uh, this fantasy where the computer Alexa will talk back oh, Alexa what a stupid little wench she is you know oh, hey Alexa how old are you <laughs> yeah, anyway and um, so basically I, I wouldn't worry about that too much mm -hmm. What I'm more interested in is increasing the smartness of machines such that they can you know, identify what you're talking about and doing it. And the problem is, one of the problems in, in artificial intelligence 
is the people as like Google, for example, are trying to build these systems where they can guess what you're really trying to say. You know, what, why make why make life difficult? In the programming language that I'm envisioning developing, there's actually a fixed protocol of, of what you know and what you'll tell it to do, and it's already fixed, so you're already speaking a language that the robots already know. There's no guesswork involved. You know, do this, do that, take this. Basically, what they have to, the, the, the challenge there is when you point and say this, that they know what this refers to, and that they're able to activate it or action on it. Like, here's a, here's a, like a, a window in your screen. Take this and get it over here. Yeah. Well, I don't know how to do that. Well, you're dumb as a robot, aren't you? <laughs> so do you have a release date for your robot language that's coming out? Yeah, I plan to think about getting started next year. All right, great. <laughs> Looking forward. So let's get back to, to coding. So what actually fascinates you about coding in the first place? Well, it's mechanical psychology, you know. You know, there's, it's age old in human history that there are rules, you know, and when there are rules, there are rules, and there are exceptions, and there's rules who it applies to and who it doesn't, and so you can think about people making laws as the first sort of programming of the society, and it's interesting to have a software insider program that's inside about where the bugs, you know, where the, the corner cases, where the, the rules didn't apply, you know, you, ha you can't, you know, you, you, ha you have to... Um, you know, not you fast on, on all day Saturday for the Sabbath and so forth, except if this and that. But what if it's a leap day, you lost track of the years? You know, you have to fast forward your calendar by a few months. Do you, like, stop eating for a couple of weeks to make up for it? Or just say, forget it, doesn't count? Or, you know, all these things you want to ask the, the head rabbi. He's like, I don't know. <laughs> Go away, Johnny. <laughs> Look at me. The programming is there. Programming is inherent in, in the human nature of trying to make rules and the complications that you get. And the problem with making rules is easy to say, do this, do that, except when it's some other case that you don't like and then it just drives people crazy because you really want to get mechanical about it, handle cases and you want to make it sort of, I, I, I won't say automated, that, that's overused, but it's true. I'd just say mechanical. Think of it like a, like a watch of gears. You want to say this is this and the gear clicks and mechanical works. And so you know, it's so easy to make rules that you can apply mechanically and blind without some judge saying, oh, it doesn't apply. And then if it doesn't apply to you, why does it apply to me? And it's a tricky concept. But it just really has little to do with software. It's sort of inherent in the, I don't know, the nature of life, shall we say. And programming is just fast forwarding into digital bytes and making things work, like really like making little machines. So that's really what it is. I find it very fascinating. Like some people find watches, Swiss watches fascinating or building engines and cars fascinating. It's just another one of those things, except yeah. with the specialities, like it's intangible, you don't really see it, it's uh, more mathematical and cerebral, but it's functional. You know, so, I mean, lawyers don't see laws either, they don't, what does a law look like? It's well written down on paper, you do things, <laughs> you know, it's, it's not all that, it's not all that different from. Exactly. Anyway. But uh, coding, it's, it's more and more important over time. Do you think it should be taught in, high, in, in school? Because our kids, they, they learn about math, English, German and so on, but not about coding, right? Um, let, let me uh, let, let me say that uh, coding, as you as you call it, programming, Program, yeah. is sort of the um, uh, sort of the high end specificness of what people do learning to use a computer. When you learn to turn it on, you learn to do things regularly, then you learn to click this in that order, and it, it, you're already sort of programming anyway. You're not exactly doing it with the language and variables. It's it, but but you're already sort of doing it. And kids and everybody actually is already learning how to do it in various ways. And programming is more when you want to, uh, instead of automating a drag and drop or saying, okay, robot, remember this, okay, and do this, except if it's this, and it starts to be, now, when does he not do this? Is it Saturday you don't do this? Or is it Thursday? Or is it 10 o'clock? And then you start writing it down in sort of like a list of things, like a recipe list, this, this, this. It's like a cooking recipe, do this, do this. And then you start... You know, you go more into let's formalize. Let's really be mathematical about it. So a variable for i is one, i is two. And you have a counter, and you uh, then then you're really sort of doing programming as you would recognize it. But you're you're already sort of partially doing it anyways. It's not a it's not a, a, a discrete step. It's more of a continuous one. And uh, you know, ironically, I would say that uh, you get into programming, you learn the, the digital aspect of computers in an analog way. The analog is a key to how humans think. Yeah. And there's a lot more analog involved in software than you might realize, for example. Yeah, I also, I also saw there are now apps out for the iPad, for the, for the iPhone and so on, where kids can actually learn how to, how to program certain things. Uh, yeah, just like in a playful way. That could be pretty interesting to teach in high school as well. My, my children, young daughters, have already been doing it for, for several oh, years. Oh, they now. have. Okay. But in simplistic ways, for example, when uh, my, my kids are about, uh, say, five years old or something, four or five, there was this nice little iPhone app, iPad app, where 
you had little bricks, and you have to uh, touch the bricks with this little bouncing uh, guy, bouncing turtle, go up here, up here, then turn right. You say bounce, bounce this, turn right, and then do the pattern. Yeah. And he, the idea is you're going to do this and then turn, and so he jumps to the bottom part and he wins. And if he jumps the wrong way, he just stops, and you, and you keep redoing it. It's like this, 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 turn right. It's visual, it's intuitive, it's kind of fun. But they're already programming, because you have to do it on the side, go forward, turn left, and jump. You see, that, that's programming steps. That's and amazing. You, you can't you can start, start early enough, huh? <laughs> well, but it, but it was for them. It wasn't really like it was a. It was just a fun fun toy. Like try this. Oh, I get it. it's a little pattern. You know, it's, yeah. it's, it wasn't considered programming <laughs> really. It was, but it, it was. So let's go to another topic. So recently, I heard you also got very much interested into Bitcoin and Ethereum. <laughs> what's what's that all about? Uh, well, there's a lot to it. I mean, it'd be more accurate to say. <laughs> Oh, 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 oh,